All right. Before we move on, um, are there any questions? Comments? Enthusiastic remarks? Yes? Why human beings try to figure out gender as one of the first things? I don't know why. I will definitely tell you that we all do that. Everyone does that. Actually, it's my next slide. <laughs> my mind was caught on that book. Absolutely. And you can think of it as either, you know, it's innate or it's learned. If it's innate, we can unlearn it. We can train ourselves. If it's learned, then we can learn differently. You know, when we see a person, we perceive a lot of things. And usually gender is one of the first ones, and we try to categorize it. And there's only two categories, male and female, for 7 billion people. And so when we have someone who we can't categorize, it bothers us instinctually. It became grateful that I didn't know. Because then I didn't approach them with anger. But I had to work really hard. It is. It is. It is a lot of work, and I think everyone does it anyway. It, but I think the point is to be aware of it. You know, do it privately, acknowledge it, and maybe just let it go. Like I can't figure out this person, acknowledge it, and be like, I'm fine with it. And a lot of it is training. It's exposure. It's reminding yourself, and reminding others too. And that's part of our work. So when you see someone you can't categorize. How do you know you can't categorize them? What are you looking for? You're looking for cues or markers to signal a person's gender. And usually we're looking for a cue to signal either one or the other. Because when we get a mixed signal or an ambiguous signal, then we keep looking for these cues. And a big part of transition is deliberately changing these cues to give the right signal to people about who we are. And everyone does this all the time, right? Look at the clothes you're wearing. Everyone has a gender, and everyone uses gender cues to express that gender. It's just that some people do it more deliberately than others. And I think as transgender people, we're usually a lot more aware of it and a lot more conscious. So what sorts of cues do we have to give the right gender signal? We have expression and name and pronouns and Non-binary people usually try to find cues that don't fall into either male or female, what we could call gender-neutral cues, or that fall into both, depending on what they want. Um, usually, things that don't immediately signal the person's gender, like an ambiguous name, or a gender-neutral pronoun, or different kind of clothing, or a hairstyle, so what happens when your public gender does not exist? We've seen this slide before. Non-binary people don't always look like their gender because what does their gender look like? So that's probably the toughest part about non-binary social transition is that we'll probably never get to our ideal destination because nobody's going to see us and know what we are. But we can try to get close to comfortable. So what are the non-binary goals? to be perceived as whatever it is you want to be perceived as. Sometimes people want to be ambiguous and fly under the radar and be seen as neither male or female, and sometimes they want to be seen as both at the same time, simultaneously, or more one, one day more than the other day, or however they're feeling. There's a, there's a lot of different expressions. So different people have different goals in how they want to use these cues to achieve the look they want. But the point is not, you know, to confuse. Like, some people think that's fun. I personally think that's a little, you know, amusing when someone's confused. But the point is to avoid being categorized incorrectly. Because when someone sees me as just a man or just a woman, then they're wrong. And it was another moment in which my gender was not seen. So... Some of these cues are very easy to change. You go to the clothing store, you get new clothes, done. You can order a binder online, you can get a haircut. And some are very difficult. 
it can be very scary to go out in public wearing clothes you've never worn before, especially if you're giving a mixed signal to other people. So these cues depend on other people. That's the meaning of social, which is all the rage these days. <laughs> so like names and pronouns, they're easy to change, right? You just declare a new name and that's it. For instance, this is my friend Alex. Stand up, say hi, Alex. Yeah. yeah. Alex is the, the kids camp coordinator here at Gender Odyssey. Um, so what's my friend's name? Alex. Alex, what's your name? Gil. Gil. We never asked Gil what his name was. See how other people have the power to dictate things about you? It was very easy to change Gil's name because I said so. But if I hadn't, I could have, I could have said something different. I could have said, no, your name is not that. So sometimes the power to change is in other people and they influence what we can do. So in one way, they're very easy to change. You just declare it. But in another way, you have to get others to go along with the change. And to get others to go along, you have to tell them about the change, which we call coming out. And coming out is hard enough to do, usually. But for non-binary people, it's specifically difficult in part because our identity and our gender is so hard to explain. I mean, we've been talking about this for an hour, and you're professionals. This is not your first time around. And do you think you could give an elevator pitch to someone who has never heard about this before? No, now imagine you're a very frightened teenager talking to your parents or your teacher. So many people, including the person coming out, may not be familiar with non-binary gender or transition or how to explain it. Their identity isn't taken seriously. You know, the, the stereotype of the genderqueer person who's just playing dress up, just being rebellious, it's just a trend, it's just a phase. You know, so when you tell your, your deepest, darkest secret to your close friend or your parent and they just dismiss it, that can be a very defining experience on what to do next. And if you keep getting this message over and over, you start to believe it. You start to believe you're just making this up. And aside from you know, not being taken seriously, there's also just rejection and safety. Um, sometimes safety doesn't need to be an act of coming out. Just, just looking what you look like can be a threat to other people. Because when you can't categorize someone, people get upset. But coming out sounds like, like you just burst open the closet door and you're done. We celebrate and we move on. It's like a one-time thing, event, over and done with. But obviously that's not the case. I like to call it disclosure because like everything else, it's a spectrum and it's an ongoing individualized process. And again, all these parts are separate and they can happen in different instances with different people in different situations. So who you disclose to? You can disclose to a friend, a family, a therapist, a coworker, you can disclose to one person, many people, all or none. What do you disclose? I'm telling you that I'm changing my name. That's it. I'm not telling you anything about my gender. Mom, I'm just going to change my name. I'm telling you that I'm getting surgery. Or I'm telling you this big explanation about my identity. Why would I want to disclose? To inform others of the change? Sometimes to just get support. You know, get reassurance. Um, to be validated, to share a part of yourself, building trust. And when you disclose, sometimes you disclose before something's going to happen, after it happens. It can be planned. It can be unplanned. It can be early on in transition. It can be later on in transition. And never is an option, too. Some people don't disclose. So what can you do as a provider to ease disclosure? And I think your suggestion was incredible. Just not only ask people, what pronouns do you prefer, but ask them, what pronouns do you prefer today? Because that way the burden of disclosure is relieved every time.
Actually, I would encourage people not to use prefer, but what do you use? Prefer implies, at least to me, that if it's convenient for me, I'll use it. So what pronoun do you use? Yeah, and, and I agree with that, that you just say what pronoun. What's your pronoun? Because preferred implies that it's a preference you can ignore. See, and our language just keeps evolving. So who has to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Bathrooms always come up. I kid you not, in every single workshop, you'll probably talk about bathrooms. And they're a touchy subject. Why? Because all of us have to pee. We're all humans. And it's impossible to go anywhere without using a public bathroom. So we know what the types of issues that trans people face in the bathroom. We get policed because of our gender. We get told we're in the wrong bathroom. Uh, because when they see someone who doesn't look like the little cape-wearing woman or the stick man, they get freaked out and they're like, what are you doing here? So bathrooms are specifically stressful for non-binary people because the choices are limited. And because bathrooms force you to gender yourself in public. So not only are you literally required to pick a gender, you're required to announce this gender choice to everyone around said bathroom. Every single time you have to pee, which is pretty much every day, many times a day. So as you can imagine, this choice, this public choice, this forced involuntary public choice is very stressful and very distressing and can cause a lot of anxiety. Er can just be plain tiring, like, oh my god, I have to choose again. So which one do we choose? Well, hopefully the best option is a gender-neutral option. Uh, you should all advocate for gender-neutral options wherever you are, even just taping signs over the existing signs, uh, create safe space so that the person, when they go to you, it's one less decision, one less worry that they have to think about. And I used to have a bathroom manifesto because public bathrooms, gendered public bathrooms, are unavoidable. So I used to have a checklist that I would go through every single time. So I would be like, is this bathroom safe? Is this bathroom clean? How likely am I to get harassed in this bathroom? And based on these choices, I, I, would, I would go through my checklist, I would choose a bathroom. And that made it a little bit easier each time. But I bring up bathrooms because as a, as a provider and as a therapist, I, all, other than having safe options, this is something that you probably need to work with. And it's something that probably the person, the client won't bring up, right? Who wants to talk about bathrooms? But it's a thing. It's an issue. And it's something that you have to have a strategy to deal with every time, right? It's not just your safety. It's just your mental you know, sanity. So the biggest lesson, which someone already said, is never make assumptions, always ask. Always ask the person how they identify. Their outer expression might not reflect their inner identity. And always ask, what pronoun do you use today? Leave the door open for changes. Because our goals change, transition is a process of evolution, and it's dynamic. And so always leave the door open. What's your name today? What do you want to achieve today, right now? Any questions? We're gonna we're gonna go to that next, and that's a perfect segue, um, because you know social transition is is not permanent, right? You can change your name, you can change your pronoun, you can change your clothes, and that's kind of the magic of it is you can just explore and and trial and error and do whatever you'd feel like an experiment even. And, and I think that's encouraged a lot of the times. Um, but you said T in surgery. And so I want to talk about medical transition because I think it's important to talk about the details of it. All right, so in this section, we're going to cover hormones and surgery, but I want to go over some basics first. Um, the W path world professional association of transgender health. <clears throat> I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. Uh, but in case you're not, they have a standards of care document which outlines framework for medical transition and their newest version was released in 2011, it's version 7, um, and I actually started transitioning before 
the newest version, so I did run up to uh, some of the less inclusive guidelines. But the new ones are very inclusive of non-binary people. Uh, they acknowledge our identities, first of all. And how do they acknowledge that? They use language that is inclusive. So they say target gender instead of opposite gender. Um, Non-binary identity is no longer a barrier to access services, so it doesn't say you must identify as a man to get blah. And the options are presented as, as less linear. The requirements are less inter interdependent. For example, my favorite example is hormones are not a requirement for surgery. So when I, when I started transitioning, the first thing I did was have surgery. I didn't come out and change my name. I had surgery. And in the version 6, you had to have hormones and you had to have a letter and all this other stuff. And I was like, but I don't want any of that. I just want surgery. So it's very important for the parts to pick and choose each part that they're not dependent on each other. And even though, you know, this is the medical transition slide and WPATH focuses on medical transition, we're going to see how it informs other parts of transition too, because the medical kind of bleeds into everything else. So it's important to remember that the guidelines are not rules. It says so in the document itself. This means that each individual should be treated on a case-by-case -case basis. Nobody's going to fit the mold. There are going to be exceptions, and that's okay. Your role as a provider is to use these guidelines to help understand your patient's needs and not as a checklist of requirements to prevent them from getting care, which is how they have been used in the past. Informed consent plays a big role, and I'm going to talk about this next. And lastly, there are a lot of myths that have surprisingly stuck around. Talk to other providers that are not in this room. Go to, go to other providers that you work with or at other conferences and, and ask them about this and see what they know. And chances are they have these very outdated notions. And one I want to highlight is this notion of the real-life experience. So... Before you were allowed to embark on any sort of medical transition, you had to live and be recognized as your target gender, it used to be the opposite gender, for 12 months. So this means that if you were assigned a male, you had to dress as a woman and be seen as a woman before you were allowed hormones or surgery or anything like that. Well, aside from being antiquated hogwash, uh, it presents a problem for non-binary people. Because what does it mean to live and be recognized as your target gender? And so I want to highlight that some of these requirements, the, the reason that they got away with them, you know, that, that we don't have them anymore, other than being outdated and not respectful, is because they don't make any sense with the new gender paradigms that we're seeing. And yes, many doctors do believe this is true. You should see the emails I get from people saying, my therapist says I have to live six months as a man. I know, I see your confused faces, but doctors still believe a lot of these really odd myths that are true. So in the old days, the provider got to dictate whether you got care or treatment or not, whether you were eligible to transition based on a set of rules, rules that were usually pretty heteronormative, like you had to be heterosexual in your opposite gender. So there was a very famous gay trans man called Lou Sullivan, and he was not allowed to transition because he liked men. So we're, you, you know, transgender and non-binary, it's a, it's a very kind of niche topic, but it applies to everything. It applies to, to gender norms and gender rules and that everyone sees. So even today, providers deny service to non-binary people because they aren't man enough or woman enough, whatever that means, um, because they don't want to, they don't need medical transition bad enough. Like, oh, no, we're reserving the medical transition to these other people who want it more. Um, or that, you know, they can't describe the narrative of being trapped in the wrong body. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with my gender, but I'm kind of okay with it. Instead of like, I want to kill myself. Right? It doesn't have to be that extreme. And so informed consent, and I'm a huge fan, is when an adult gives permission to make an adult decision for themselves. And nobody has to approve your transition. And it gives non-binary people more freedom to decide for themselves which parts of medical transition they want to undergo. And another of these myths is that you need a letter from a therapist, right? Because a the therapist is the gatekeeper. And with the new standards of care, 
That's sometimes not a requirement, sometimes it is. Uh, for instance, for hormones, you don't need a letter from a therapist. But for surgery, it's, it's suggested that you do. But there's a lot of surgeons that operate under informed consent, and they don't care. They're like, you're an adult, you want breasts, you want me to take them away, whatever you want, I'll do it. So they're, the role as a provider is to help the patient make that determination for themselves, not to make it for them. Absolutely. It's, you know, if a therapist doesn't have to provide a letter, what's their role then? Well, there's still a lot of support that goes on, you know, safety. Uh, even if it's a medical thing, even if you, you aren't all surgeons, you know, there's a lot of physical and mental and emotional things that go behind a medical procedure. Um, there's a financial aspect. There's, you can cope with the social consequences. Surgery itself is very scary. And medical transition isn't always an obvious step. So a big part is the should I, shouldn't I kind of thing that you have to work out. You know, is this the right step for me? So I always stress the role of mental health and always encourage people, see a therapist not because you're broken, but because you need support. Because this is a difficult journey and you need all the help you can get. And figuring out your identity is complicated. But most importantly, medical transition does not determine whether someone's gender identity is valid or not. So some non-binary people choose to medically transition, some do not, just like some binary trans people choose to not medically transition. And that's perfectly valid. And there's this kind of assumed toxic hierarchy in the transgender community based on how much you medically transition. And I'm trying to do away with that slowly because it's wrong. You know, you are who you are, whatever you do to your body, it's your choice. And the reasons for whatever you're doing should be respected. All right, I want to briefly go over hormones, and the following slide is a bit confusing, so don't worry if you're confused. The point of it is to just give you a marker so you can do more research later. Because I've done a lot of research, and a lot of this is very difficult to put together. So hormones. You have the masculinizing hormone, which is testosterone, which you usually take if you are female assigned, and you get a deeper voice, facial and body hair, uh, you can bald, muscle growth, etc. So male assigned at birth people may take estrogen to feminize. And I put these in quotes because, again, our language is very limited, right? But we have to describe it somehow. And right now, these are the words I have. Um, and the feminizing process is breast growth, softer skin, reduced libido, reduced muscle growth, among other effects. What I want to highlight here that's important is that it's not just estrogen, there's also antiandrogens, which block testosterone. Because if you naturally produce estrogen, you went through an estrogen-based puberty, your breasts grew, and then you stop. It doesn't continue to feminize. Your breasts don't keep growing indefinitely. Imagine that. If you have a naturally producing testosterone, you were probably male assigned, um, testosterone continues to masculinize you indefinitely. So your body hair keeps growing, your facial hair keeps growing, your voice keeps deepening. So a big part of, of medical transition in hormones is to block the masculinization of testosterone, not just adding in that feminization. So it gets a little more complicated and there's a, a lot of other hormones. But there's no gender neutral hormone. We just have two and they're based on male or female. Um, and so a lot of non-binary people want to, you know, lose some characteristics without gaining new ones, and that's not really possible. And there's still a lot of unknowns in what's medically possible or advisable. For instance, if you just block testosterone, then you have no hormones in your body. Is that okay? Is that not okay? You know, jury's still out. A lot of doctors will tell you different things. So what do non-binary people want out of hormones? First is physical effects. Um, you know, if you have a high-pitched voice, you can take testosterone to lower it and it can sound more androgynous, for example. 
Or people sometimes want both gender characteristics to grow breasts and a beard. That's fine. Uh, and in this example, voice can be social. So just like physical aspects can social, can, can signal our, our gender, right? So a lot, sometimes the reason to take hormones is the physical effect is a byproduct of the main social effect that they want to achieve. And lastly, some people report feeling better emotionally on, on hormones, uh, reduced anxiety, and, you know, that's their experience. But hormones aren't perfect. They're a package deal, kind of like two-in-one shampoo. You can't pick and choose what changes you get. So many times, non-binary people only want to acquire a very specific set of changes, and they want to actively avoid this whole other set of changes. And you can't do that. Hormones are kind of unpredictable. Um, we generally know, you know, if you take testosterone, your voice will deepen, you will grow facial hair. What we don't know is how much facial hair are you going to grow? How fast is it going to grow? How deep is your voice going to get? How big are your breasts going to grow? It's impossible to know beforehand. And so a big part of that is the uncertainty, and it's scary. And two important things about hormones is there's reversible changes and there's permanent changes. So there are two sets of changes. Um, reversible are the ones that you get only while you are on hormones. Once you are off hormones, they go away. Permanent, as soon as you take hormones and whatever it is in your body changes, it stays. So voice change is a permanent change. Once your voice drops, that's it. There's no going back. Muscle redistribution is a reversible change. So if you're on estrogen, you will have less muscle. If you're on testosterone, you will have more. But as soon as you're off, it goes away. And unfortunately, many people sometimes want the reversible changes, but not the permanent ones. So hormones are messy and unpredictable and imperfect, but they also give us a lot of flexibility and control. They are gradual. Unlike surgery, they're not instantaneous. You don't sprout a full beard overnight. You don't become a werewolf, which was very comforting to me. Um, it gives you a lot of time to test them out, you know, experimenting. Take a little, see how you feel. If you don't like it, you can always go off. You can take a low dose. And low dose is a very a great way for non-binary people to buy more time, right, to try it out, see how much they like it. You get the same effects. You just get them slower and to a lesser degree. And at some point, you can even plateau the changes. So you don't see any more changes build up. Um, and you can be on a low dose indefinitely. Or you can stop taking hormones. You can be like, I'm going to take hormones for six months, and then I'm going to stop. And a lot of people don't know you can stop. You can. As long as, you know, your body still works, it'll go back, right? And then the reversible changes will revert. Um, and then you can go back on. If you stop the hormones, you can take them again. And obviously, it's not medically advisable to be on the roller coaster, but it's very comforting to hear that you have a choice in this and that if you really freak out, then you don't have to keep going. But there's a lot of concerns that non-binary people have, and mostly it involves some sort of compromise, a physical compromise or a social compromise. So what if I still don't pass? Well, passing is a relative term. You know, what do you want to pass as? Androgynous, masculine, feminine, both? The, what's behind this fear is that hormones will have zero impact in their gender, right? Because there's a social component. What if I pass too much? They also worry that they're going to be seen exclusively as the opposite gender, and this also makes them uncomfortable. What if I hate them? They, a, lot, a big worry is that they can't cope with the effects that they don't want. Right? And this is why low dose and gradual give you a really good way to say, hey, I'm seeing this change. I really can't take it. I'm going to stop. What if I end up going all the way? So the fear is that one day they'll look in the mirror and they realize they've gone too far by accident and, you know, you screwed up. But what if it wasn't an accident? What if I ended up going all the way on purpose, and now I'm looking like this binary trans man, binary trans woman, and I like it? It's, it's a very strange fear, because it's, it's growth, right? You're imagining something that you'll want in the future that you don't want right now. So today's truth might not be tomorrow's. 
And ultimately, it's about balance and compromise, and this doesn't just apply to hormones. Compromise is just an inherent part of the experience, you think, with, with any transgender person. Let's quickly go over surgery. It's a magical sex change, right? You have the surgery, and poof, you're transformed. You're done. Or you're not really trans until you have surgery. Obviously, these are myths, if you haven't noticed. Um, surgery is the last step. That's another myth. It's the culmination of your transition. When, I've, As I said before, it can be the first step. It's the surgery, right? Well, there's not just one surgery. And this is Aidan Key, our conference director, and his twin sister, Brenda. So here's an overview of the surgeries. There are many surgical procedures. Surgery is less flexible than hormones. It's not low dose. It's not gradual. But even within these procedures, there's a lot of options that a lot of people don't know about. So what prevents a non-binary person from accessing surgery? Well, identity. You know, doctors think that their gender is not real. Um, who will love me? This is a common concern. How will others see my identity? I have a mixed, non-standard gendered body. Who's going to be attracted to that? And uh, doctors themselves are sometimes a the barrier. They think it's unethical to leave a patient in a mixed gendered state. I have heard this before. Um, or they think that, you know, these outdated rules like the real life experience. Or they themselves don't know about the surgical alternatives. So why would, does a non-binary person want to have surgery? To alleviate physical discomfort. Usually that's, that's the primary reason. Um, sometimes it's social. You know, if you have huge breasts, you're probably going to get gendered as female most of the time. <clears throat> so it, it helps with passing whatever gender you want to pass as. And again, it's an individual choice. And it, surgery can be kind of the culmination. It can be very life-affirming. It can be a very important step. And so that's also part of not trivializing it, right? It is, it is a huge deal sometimes. If it's not important to the person, it doesn't have to be. But sometimes it is. And therapy is not a requirement, and hormones are not a requirement, and there's a lot of hidden options. I think I have like five minutes left, so I'm going to go over legal transition for two minutes, and then we're going to have questions. Legal gender is only as good as the document it's on. You can have different legal genders on different documents. So that kind of sounds like a non-binary dream, right? <laughs> well, not really, because you can only have one of two legal genders. Can you all guess which ones they are? Yeah, male and female. And so why would a non-binary person want to go through all the trouble to change their legal gender to end up with one that is still incorrect? Again, it's personal. It's a personal reason. Some people are just very uncomfortable with the birth gender, and it's like the other one's not so bad. I'd rather change it. Uh, sometimes one option is safer, and sometimes it's a way to affirm a trans identity, right? Especially when you have all these kind of policing and legitimizing and hierarchies. It's like, well, I'm real. And the requirements for each document will vary. But you, I asked before, nobody here is a lawyer. But you have power. You have the power of the pen. It is very glamorous to sign off on paperwork. But most legal gender changes require a, a medical sign-off of some sort. And this is where the WPATH standards come in again, because they carry weight in the legal sphere. There's a wide gray area in terms of this medical sign-off. Sometimes it's very vague, and it says the person has undergone medical treatment. And if they go to you as a therapist, that is medical treatment. Done. The providers can also help shape the law by pressuring others and offering their expert opinion. Lastly, a legal name change is also a very great alternative to uh, making your transition real and legitimizing your identity without all the trouble because, at least in the U.S., a legal name change is very easy and it can be very satisfying to just be seen as your real name. All right, so we covered the main uh, components, social, medical, and legal, and we built a framework. Transition has a lot of parts, and it's a process, it's gradual, it takes time, individual goals, 
a unique journey where the destination is usually unknown and we're easing the path towards finding comfort or alignment or recalibration or peace, zen, whatever you want to call it. So with this framework, you've learned about non-binary identity, the challenges that transition presents specifically to non-binary people, and what the options and alternatives are. And to me, there are three takeaways. Individualized care. Every person is their own person. Get informed. Do a lot of research. A lot of research. And just listen. Never assume. And we're done. So what are your three takeaways? What are your questions? What are your comments? I think we have like one minute, so talk really fast. Thank you. You mentioned that I see that you're talking tomorrow, and you mentioned that youth is tomorrow. Yes. I'm wondering how different tomorrow's talk is going to be from today. Uh, the introduction, like the f first 10, 20 minutes, are the same, but the rest is different. The cookies are the same. Yeah. There are no cookies. No. I know. The cookies were just for this one. <laughs> For a just a blog person, you are extremely well versed. Thank very you. Knowledgeable. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. And keep learning.